Yeah, thanks for joining me uh, once more, possibly, <laughs> or for the first time. Uh, I talked about the memory model this morning, so this time I'm going to talk about something that I work with um, a lot in my professional life, uh, but also in open source. Uh, as mentioned, um, I develop a library called ByteBuddy, which uh, I guess many people haven't heard of, um, despite its, its broad application, because as mentioned also, it's used by a lot of um, libraries internally to create um, dynamic code. Uh, so what ByteBuddy does is that it generates classes at runtime, but it also modifies classes at runtime, which in core is, is what Java agents do. And uh, Java agents have become uh, increasingly more common in the Java space. So if you have a production environment and you want to see yeah, performance statistics or you want to uh, do distributed tracing, security, interception, and so forth, then um, a lot of these tools uh, yeah, modify your code. Um, prior to execution, and uh, ByteBuddy is a common choice for, for this task. Um, and uh, the goal today is that I not only explain to you what a Java agent is, I want to talk a little bit about ByteBuddy as well to show you, because it's fairly easy with, with a tool like ByteBuddy, to create your agents uh, yourself. And uh, maybe that's an option for you at some point, and there's also, actually, if you're interested in this, there a lot of companies look for, for like in especially in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of openings in this developer tooling market. Uh, which normally make use of these APIs. Right, so we, I want to start out with agent fundamentals because um, I don't expect people, even senior, senior Java developers, to have heard of what Java agents are uh, because they're meant to be working in the background without interfering with you. So you all have typed public static void main in your life once or twice. Um, we all have. And that's what most people know, know as the entry point to a Java program, right? Within the main method, that's where everything starts. This is where your program enters and exits, and uh, it, it is incepted there, and it is basically executed and, and completed there. But a Java agent um, is another entry point, right? So normally you have main class, main entry, uh, something like this. A Java agent is nothing else but a jar file just as much with a manifest file just as much, only that you don't type public static void main this time, but you type public static void pre-main this time. An agent also takes a string argument, a single one is the big difference, uh, just not an array. And uh, it can also be referenced uh, with pre-main class agent pre-entry, for example. And as the name suggests, pre-main will be executed before main on the main thread. So in essence, what a Java agent is, is a, a small program that you can add to an existing program uh, without changing the original program, and that will be executed before it. And that's important to understand, this is two jar files, and this jar file that contains the pre-main class, you can add to all Java applications on all servers that you run. So, so let's say in a trivial case, you just write something, and you will print hello world from my agent, and this will be printed for every program. It's of course not useful, but it is an entry point, uh, and it's good to know that it exists. So not only one Java agent can be run on a virtual machine, you can have infinitive Java agents, as long as your operating system supports a class path that long. But yeah, you can, you can basically have them um, combine as well. It's not only that, though. There's a third entry point in the Java space, which is agent main. Those are the three entry points. There are, if you have like a Java certification quiz once in your life, and they ask how many Java entry points are there, you will obviously go for one most of the time, but it is actually three. Uh, agent main is just as pre-main, only that it doesn't run before the main method, but it runs in parallel to the main method. And it is run on an attached thread, and the, the beauty of, of agent main is that you can initialize this execution from outside the Java virtual machine. So you have already started a program, you have executed the main method, and it had started to run your, your main thread, and then you will have a process ID, a PID, and then you can use another program and API in the Java virtual machine to say, I want to take this jar with the agent main method and add it to the Java virtual machine. And that way you can basically add additional threads with additional jar files to an already running program. Right? So you can basically enrich something. And this is important if you, for example, want to debug something, you have a program that runs and misbehaves, and you would like to add something, like a live patch for instance, and then you can actually do this. But we'll look more into this later. 
Uh, and again, there can be more than one agent main method. There can be many, many of them. And, um, but they will all run one, one thread, so they will not run in parallel. But normally you span new threads from agent main and then return as quickly as possible to avoid blocking the attached thread. So what's a Java agent in practice? So I already mentioned, we do like a hello world example. You run public static void free main. And all you do is this time hello from argument. And how do you run this agent? You will just add it to the Java command line. If you just type Java, actually, it lists all the command line options that you can do. You can like do class pass, CP. You can do, um, I don't know, like add a system property with minus D. But it will also list add a Java agent with minus Java agent. And if you ever wondered what that was, that's what it is. You will just say Java agent and then point to a jar file. This jar file must have a manifest file that points to a, a pre-main class. And then you can also specify an argument, in this case, my agent. And when I run this program, and it may run with any application, any class path application, and I run main app entry now, then this program will run as expected, but also it will print hello from my agent before anything else happens, right? And this is boring, I know, this is not exciting, but it will very quickly become this exciting. Um, but before we look into the, the application, Agent main, similar thing, right? This time you don't specify on the jar file, on the, on the, on the command line. This time, as I mentioned, there's an API in Java, in the virtual machine. You can type this and import this in any Java program. You say virtual machine attach, and then the, the process ID that this Java process, Java main app entry, um, executes, that one you must find in your Linux shell or you print it from the app. And then from the virtual machine API, from a different Java application, you can say, I want to add my agent to this already existing agent, and then you detach again, right? So your process A can find any Java process on your operating system that runs under the same user and attach to it. So any Java virtual machine that you own, any process that you own, you can enrich at a later point. And this will work with any process, right? So. Why is that interesting? Java agents, the one with pre-main and the one with agent main, they take a second argument. That second argument is optional, but it's the one you're normally out for. Because the second argument, called instrumentation, is basically a toolbox that the JVM offers only to Java agents. It's the only way in the Java virtual machine to get an instance of instrumentation is to use an agent. And it will allow you to intrude um, yeah, the virtual machine to some degree, right? Uh, and it offers a lot of useful stuff. For example, it allows you to uh, read the actual size and memory of an object. So it gives you an accurate amount of bytes that an object uses in memory, right? Not the one that you might think it uses, uh, but the one that this operating system and this distribution of the JVM reserves in memory, just as an example. The one most people are out after, and the one that I'll represent and introduce today, is the transformation API, however. The instrumentation API allows you to install a so-called class file transformer. And this class file transformer will be notified every time a class is loaded in your program. In this case, it's a pre-main agent. So any class that your actual application will ever load will be passed to our Java agent and this transformer that it installs, and it will have the opportunity now to change the class file. So let's say you run an application and you use Apache HTTP client. When your application loads Apache HTTP client, the class file, so the dot .class file that was compiled and inserted in this jar file that Apache HTTP offers, will be passed through this API. And in this lambda here, it's the last argument, it's just a byte array, because any, any file is just a byte array in essence. And what it returns will be just another byte array. And now, I mentioned already, I, I worked in APM, for example. Let's say you want to implement distributed tracing, automated distributed tracing, like New Relic, like AppDynamics, and Stana, all these tools do. You can already grasp how this will work. How do these tools implement their tooling? They will have a list of all classes they are curious over and say, all right, here's someone's loading an HTTP client. I want to change this HTTP client to become a different HTTP client. It should still work exactly as it's supposed to work. It shouldn't break your program. But every time I send an HTTP request to another uh, server, 
I will add my tracing headers. So I will say this call comes from app so and so. And then also I will send this information to my backend and then show you a nice graph, right? Or <coughs> other example of agents like an SQL injection protection agent. It will instrument your JDBC driver. Once you load your Oracle driver, for example, the Oracle driver will be passed through this class file transformer. And um, it will um, then also be modified to, for example, check if you are using a prepared statement correctly. Or it will pass your SQL and see if you have unescaped values there that aren't intended to, to run, right? And that's basically how a Java agent works. Um, you can also return null, saying I'm not interested in this class and then it won't be transformed. But everything you want, basically, you can rewrite your entire program. Another opportunity, and that's more common with agent main methods, uh, agent main agents, is that you can retransform classes even. The JVM, every JVM has the capability of taking classes that are already loaded and to modify them while they are executing it. So they will, for example, let's say you deployed a buggy app, but the application cannot be shut down. It's some critical service and it's poorly um, yeah, um, distributed, so you cannot shut down the server. Complete um, disaster in a way, because you cannot shut it down, you cannot fix the bug, but you can, in theory. So you can deploy a Java agent, you just need to take the PID of this Java process that you think is broken, then you deploy in your agent, the agent main method will be executed of it, and then you say, I want to retransform my class something something adapter or whatever it is, and I say, I want to retransform it, and you just rewrite the class that is broken to represent the, the, the actual working class. And um, yeah, this way you can, uh, in a way, uh, yeah, fix a bug in a running JVM even. And uh, this sounds far-fetched, and maybe it is, but uh, there's a lot of like very performance-sensitive tooling um, that doesn't want to add, for example, log statements, if you think about uh, all these low-latency networking libraries. Uh, some of them offer Java agents of this kind to rewrite their own uh, classes to add logging after the fact. And this is necessary to basically for them to have certain bytecode constraints. They don't want to make methods too long by litter them with logging. And that way they can have all the performance with the capability of adding the logging on demand if something is broken. Right? All you have to do is you have to add true as a second argument to the add transformer method, and then you have to tell the JVM what classes you want to retransform. And this is all standard JVM API. As long as you can map one byte array to another byte array that's still a valid class file, you can use that. Right. So you still have to see do I should transform the class, then you transform it if you want to, or you turn null if you just want to leave it alone. All right. This sounds very uh, easy to and straightforward. Uh, however, before we go into how ByteBody can help you to actually map these byte arrays from one to another, uh, I want to just also mention the limitations. Um, if you want to change the method body, you can do that. What you cannot do is you cannot add method members, uh, class members, if a class is already loaded. If a class is already loaded, you have to keep the shape of the method intact. That means you can change all method bodies. You can basically replace everything what is in a method. But you cannot add a new one. And you cannot remove one, and you cannot add a field, and you cannot remove a field. What you can do is you can change annotations, in theory, if that's useful for you. But uh, nothing, nothing that changes the shape, the, the reflection shape of a, of a class. There's a Jap uh, trying to change this, but I don't think it will get merged in the next century. So I wouldn't just yeah, consider that. Uh, there was a time when you could add static methods, uh, private static methods, but also that is not possible anymore. And the JEP 159 is a really old JEP from like eight years ago. So uh, I'd say it's fair, despite it being still open, that we cannot expect it anytime soon. Uh, yeah, it's just not a goal. Uh, just one ugly slide. You can also write Java agents in not Java. Actually, not Java agents anymore. They're just native agents then. Uh, if you ever coded in JNI, that's what it is, basically. You can do JNI agents if you read really low capabilities, lo like low-level capabilities. Um, for example, if you use a tool like JRebel, they write their agents in C because they make intrusive changes that wouldn't work well enough with a Java agent in many cases. Uh, so we just forget the slide, right? But this is what a native agent looks like. So they exist as well. You don't have to write agents in Java. You can write them in C, 
but I prefer them very much in Java, adds platform compatibility, and a lot of debugging headaches. All right, how, how is this even possible? Java agents are very particular to the Java virtual machine, or agents in general. Uh, a lot of VMs do not support them, and a lot of non-VM languages do not support them, or non does support them. But the, the beauty of Java is that when you write a, a class, a source code file, then this class will just be a, yeah, a, a very good representation of the source code file, just in bytecode. Uh, but still, you can often very well decompile a class file back to the Java source. And then the class file is basically just a binary. So this binary is what you get passed. And an important fact about Java is that Java C is not an optimizing compiler. Java C does only do a translation, but the JVM does the optimization. If a heavily optimizing compiler wouldn't be bundled with the JVM, which is the JIT compiler, then Java agents couldn't work well because the transformer at runtime would need to re-optimize the program, something which would be too expensive for production systems. But since the JIT profiles and the optimizers on the fly, Java agents can just work and you don't have any penalty in terms of performance unless the little peak that you will get while the transformation is applied, which is often very much at the beginning of a program lifetime. Uh, just also some more examples for where this can be useful. Uh, I don't know if any of you used Mukido in, in their life. Uh, I'm one of the maintainers of Mukido, uh, since I also write ByteBody and it's very uh, bytecode heavy. Uh, but what we do in Mukido since Java 17 is also that we use Java agents to do the mocking. Because before we always created subclasses and then we instantiated these classes um, uh, using like some tricks with unsafe API, but that's not longer possible with Java 17, which strictly encapsulates all internal APIs. So what we do now is that when you run Mukido, Mukido will attach itself as an agent to the current JVM. And if we have then a mocking class, basically we add the mocking into the method. So in the method, instead of having the regular method body that you wrote, we add like a small if statement to the beginning of the method and say like, if this instance is a mock, then do the mocking thing. Else, do the same thing you did before, right? And this is also even there Java agents can be, can be useful. So if you use Mokito with Java 17, Mokito inline, then um, you already use Java agents today. Uh, another uh, tool that I, I helped to create is Instana. Um, a good example also for the dynamic agent. Instana is an APM tool like AppDynamics or so forth. I'm not um, associated much. I don't get money to mention them. I just know the tool well. That's why I use them as an example. Uh, Instana is like most modern APM tools, just scans your operating system for Java processes, finds them, right? Pit scan, there's a Java process, there's a Java process, and gets itself into there, right? So I see like, yeah, this is an app I want to monitor, and then Apache HV client, and there's a Kafka driver, and there's a JDBC driver. I want to trace all of these calls and create statistics and nice dashboards. And the, the beauty of, of that, since you can attach to a running JVM, and the, this is the example I mentioned before, that you can restart the JVM, might not be because of a bug, but because it's a production system and you can't just restart it to upgrade your monitoring tool. But if the process then gives you feedback, right? You can say, there's a class I've never seen, so then you just create a report. It's like this library they use and you might miss something. Then a dev can get a notice, like here's an HTTP client that we haven't support for yet. So then the developer gets that notice, they fix that in the agent, the agent gets updated, and then while the Java process, th the same old Java process that's been running for half a year, uh, is still executing, we just deploy a new agent version. And the old one gets thrown out and the new one gets thrown in, and you can constantly update and more and more tooling adopts this method. So this is how a lot of modern JVM tooling is, is implemented today. Yeah, so and all, all that through some agent main method that someone wrote and a manifest file. And now that you know what you can do, I hopefully have <laughs> motivated you to actually want to learn how to do it. Right, yeah, Docker, of course, you can also uh, break through if you take effort. All right, so before I get to my library, that uh, again, it's an open source Apache 2 license library, so uh, no, no, no attempt to sell you something here tonight. Um, I just want to show you how it's been done in the old days, <laughs> or still being done in many, many uh, areas, right? Uh, if you ever touched code instrumentation, you probably came across ASM. ASM is a library for parsing and writing 
class files. So instead of what you can in theory do is, is you can take the Java Virtual Machine specification, say, all right, this is what a class file looks like. At this offset, you have to write the name of the class. At this offset, you have to write how many fields there are and at what byte offsets the fields are defined and the annotations and so forth. You can do all that, or you can just use ASM, and ASM will basically tell you that. So you can register a listener and say, like, yeah, every time you find a field in a class file, tell me. And then I might do something with it. Uh, and this is basically just reading a file and writing it back to a, to a writer, and then accept it and you transform it back to a class file. So you can do that and have no done nothing to the class file. But if you do like wrap the writer with another class visitor, you can, for example, say, tell me when you f like read the header file information of the class file, and then I want to make every class in my application public by adding a modifier. And this works well. I'm, I'm a fan of ASM to the degree that ByteBody uses it internally. It's a very powerful library. But if you just look at this slide, this is the, the simplest way of using ASM. So I'll just show you some ugly slides again now. Uh, yeah. So this is already just adding a bit of code. Then you have to have a class visitor, a method visitor, and I won't get much into it. Um, but there's then these two blocks. And if you just look at this shortly, if you read it for five minutes now, if I, I walk out and let you study this, then you will probably understand what it does. But you can imagine how blown up code can become when you use ASM a lot. So uh, the same is true that it's very complicated to, to match classes, because a class file itself only contains the name of the classes and of its interfaces. Let's say you wanted to instrument all classes that, that, inst that implement a certain interface, then the class file doesn't tell you if a class implements an interface because you would need to check the subclass, and you would need to check the interfaces, and the interfaces' interfaces, so you would have to load a lot of code. And again, you can do all this in ASM, and you can load it, and blah, and I'm not even going to show it to you, but jump over it how you can avoid it. Because in practice, if you're working on a team with more than two people, uh, ASM quickly reaches its limit. And this is one of the reasons I created ByteBuddy um, back in 2014, originally, and has grown and grown and grown, and now it has, I think, uh, I don't know, 40, 50 million downloads a month. So it's become a pretty substantial tool in the Java ecosystem um, because a lot of other libraries use it. It's not, it doesn't have a lot of users, but it has a lot of users that have a lot of users. And for an agent, I'd say today it's, a, it's the best approach because ByteBody uses a DSL. And if you just read this code, I hope it doesn't take you fem five minutes to understand it, uh, but much shorter, because ByteBody basically just asks you what you want to do. For a Java agent, ByteBody's entry point is uh, agent builder default. And then you can tell it, I want to instrument all types that have a super type that is named my target user type, right? What will this do? It will instrument all classes that have a super type with this name. Easy enough. You can also implement this yourself. It's a functional interface that gives you a type description, which offers basically all APIs that the Java Reflection API has for the class class. And then you tell it, I want to transform these types. And then you get a builder and say, any method I want to instrument to invoke println with argument string on the field out with the argument hello world. And then I want to do a super call, say, invoke the original instance. And then you install it on the instrumentation API. And this is, again, the Java API that I introduced in the beginning. And you can take my word. You can copy this code. You can paste it into a class file, uh, add ByteBody and add a manifest file and run it on your apps. So, so and then just, of course, change user type with something you actually use in the application, and it will print uh, hello world every time one of any method of this type is invoked. Right? And this is, again, a hello world example for an agent. It's not useful, but you can imagine how you now can instrument APM tool. And the basics are not difficult. The bytecode instrumentation, if you wanted to build your own tooling today, I'd say, not only because of ByteBuddy, but also because of backend advances, it's, it's fairly easy to write something like AppDynamics yourself. Um, the trick of all these professional APMs is that they have plugins for a million libraries already. So that's where the, 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 the intel property intelligence is from. Right. An even better way than just printing Hello World is something in ByteBody that's called advice. And I'd say all agents that are developed in the last four or five years use ByteBody and use advice, really. It's kind of become my main 
source of income. <laughs> That's how I know. Um, and uh, also that is fairly easy to use for you. Advice code tries to bridge the gap between writing an agent and changing code and you people already being very proficient in just writing plain old Java code. Because advice and ByteBuddy is just any code that you write and then you annotate it with advice on method enter. As you can imagine, now we write system out print on Hello World, not in the ByteBuddy DSL, but we will just have a visitor that you add to like any builder that you register. Now, again, user type, so as before. And ByteBuddy will take this user type class that it finds and, as the annotation promises, copy paste the Hello World code or anything that you wrote in there to the beginning of the method. So again, it will be executed before. And that way, you can imagine, it's fairly easy to write this code because now you can write arbitrarily complex Java code in this advice method and have it like, copied into your target system. Uh, also, for the agent main bits, you can just say, yeah, disable class format changes and apply retransformation. And now you can do this with an agent that you throw into an existing program at a later point. All right. It's not only hello world uh, at the method entry. You can also write hello world at method exit. And this is straightforward. What will happen if you add method exit to a Java method is that it will copy the return value or the original method body. It will execute the method body, copy the return value to your field, also add the exit advice code, and then return the actual value. So it will transform the byte array that you got as an input accordingly to represent this new byte array and give it as an output and present it to Java to machine uh, API for creating this output. And now you can piece the bits together. I'm not going to deep into There's a lot of like features in ByteBuddy. For example, uh, if you have multiple returns, it will do go to instruction for you. If you do this in ASM, you have to create all this by yourself, right? But you can also interact with the original program. For example, if the method you're looking for has an argument, you can just add an argument to your advice code as well. And you will annotate it uh, with advice argument, and then this will be copied in accordingly again. Important to understand, when you write a Java agent, then ByteBody will take this as a template. You will not be able to set a breakpoint, for example, in this template and have it executed, because ByteBody copy-pastes it. The upturn for your users is that ByteBody retains the debugging information in the target classes, so your users will not even notice that the bytecode has been manipulated. That's kind of the big upside for, for Java agents. And that's why many people, besides using Java agents, haven't really noticed them. Uh, they're supposed to be uh, hidden. And of course, you can even assign values. This is where you might notice the Java agents. Let's say you have this um, agent that does SQL injection prevention, then it might override some of your SQL statements, for example, by manually escaping code. And then these use yeah, overrides uh, in your code, which then has the same effect in your code. But then you change the program. Normally, that's nothing you want to do. You can also change return values, same idea. You just assign it and so forth. And there's a whole bunch. I mean, I've, doing, I've done the library for 10 years now, so you can imagine that it has uh, a lot of features that I could talk forever about, to be honest. Yes. But as a, again, like if you got the basics and you have your Hello World program, it's easy to go step by step. And there's a lot of documentation, a lot of JavaScript, uh, Java doc not JavaScript, to be found. Uh, so I'd rather talk about a few of the aspects that uh, all this brings. I already mentioned um, that um, it's inline code, so you don't, you're not able to put breakpoints into your code. It also means that you don't be, you're not able to have fields in your advice code, and you don't have uh, the ability to have uh, helper methods. Because if you have a private static method that's uh, in your advice code and you copy-paste the method uh, content to your target class, then the private method will no longer be accessible. Um, and the same is for the f true for the field. So all state has to be injected. Again, by annotations. Uh, there's many, many default annotations in advice, but everything you want to get into an agent, you have to kind of smuggle through uh, some channel uh, for the targeted method to having access to this value, right? 
And there's, there's again, potentially ad advances in Java for uh, lifting this advice at some, uh, this limitation at some point, but uh, not as today, and I wouldn't count on it, uh, developing a tool today. Uh, another feature that if you don't want to add code in the beginning and the end of the method, but, but it also lets you substitute calls. Let's say you have an annoying system out println in your code somewhere in the library that you can't change. Then ByteBuddy, for example, allows you to substitute that with a logging library and so forth. But normally, it's nothing you need to do. Uh, for example, here, stop just means you delete that code and it goes out. You say, like, again, I want to take all super types of my user type and then I find a member substitution, find all methods named println, and stop them on the method named foo. And then you're done. Right? Yep. OK, so uh, I have 18 minutes left. Um, so I'll look a bit into class loading. And <laughs> is class loading again is a topic that Java developers tend to love to avoid. Um, class loaders in Java are probably the biggest hassle when you are writing tooling for Java programs. And it's something you very seldom think about when you write actual programs for Java. So for those of you who have never heard of a class loader, a class loader is basically the mechanism in the JVM that loads a class. For example, Java lang string will always be loaded by the bootloader. Those three loaders are the three loaders that every Java virtual machine creates when it started. And the distinction is to basically separate the JVM's core libraries from your program. Your program will be loaded by the system lo loader. Everything you have in the class path will be loaded there. Uh, in the middle, there's the extension loader, which is a sort of like a retired mechanism where you can move jar files into your Java virtual machine installation, and they will be available for everything, but not in the same yeah, environment as the, the, the string class and the thread class, for example, but separate, but above the system loader. So every time your Java virtual machine tries to load a class, it will ask every loader in this hierarchy if they know it, and then try to load it themselves. So uh, so, far, so, so, so far so good, this is easy to, to handle when it's just these three loaders. But if you have used OSGI or anything, Tomcat, um, or even custom loaders like Spring, has then you can see quickly that uh, the Java virtual machine has become a complex ecosystem. Because what Tomcat, for example, does is, and if you use Tomcat, you know that you can like, draw in a jar file in your Tomcat folder, and it loads it, and you can take it out again, and then the application dies. Uh, this works while, because Tomcat creates a new class loader for every app, and this class loader sep uh, represents a separate namespace for this application. So. Everything that's loaded, for example, in the web app one loader will not be visible to the web app two loader because web app one and web app two are on different leaves of the, the class loader tree. Right? If OSGI creates a module loader, then this module loader will only be able to access its own modules and the ones it's imported and so forth. And if you implement a custom loader, it can do whatever you want. Right? For agents, you can imagine. This is a challenge because agents always are loaded on the system loader. They are treated as a like a class path element. So if you add an agent, for example, it will be in the hierarchy below your Tomcat applications, for example, and not be able to see them. Right? So the problem here is now that you cannot access your Tomcat apps from your agent. And not if you have like a custom loader like Spring Boot, uh, it might not be able to access your agent either. So they don't, won't share a hierarchy at all together. Uh, the problem is now that if you write advice code, which is loaded on the system loader, it won't have access to things like HTTP response, which is a part of Tomcat, right? It's part of the web app loader up here, right? It's not visible. Also, if you have like a tracing recorder, like many tools have in this space, then this tracing recorder again lives on the system loader, and the custom Spring Boot loader cannot see it because they don't share a hierarchy. So how can you work with this? Uh, this is where yeah, you typically have to put a lot of effort into. Fortunately, ByteBuddy can solve it by merging class loaders for you, basically creating a hypothetical class loader that has two parents, which is something that uh, the Java virtual machine doesn't allow normally. Uh, so 
Again, hopefully, if you want to try your own agent, you can do the Hello World example where everything is in the bootloader and uh, in the system loader and not care about it at all. But once you want to write a professional tooling, you will have to dig very deep into this topic and um, yeah, allow ByteBody hopefully to um, yeah, do the class file resolution for you because classes will live on different namespaces, different class loader namespaces. A uh, similar problem um, is that you will need to have a, boot, uh, a bootloader. Fortunately, I mentioned that the instrumentation API has many, many internal capabilities, like measuring the size of an object. Another capability I haven't mentioned is that it allows you to append to the bootloader. So you can actually enrich the system classes. You can enrich, uh, a, you can add your own Java Lang class, your own Java Lang dispatcher, or so forth, by adding it to the bootloader. And then this dispatcher basically is available on the bootloader. And since the bootloader is in the core of all hierarchies, it will be available everywhere. And every Java agent that's uh, more than two weeks old will basically end up doing this, resolved by virtual class loaders that represent multiple parents, and inject some dispatcher into the bootloader to have universal visibility. So if you browse around in your JVM and you have any tooling, like some, some agent attached, some, some APM or whatever, you will actually, if you browse the Java Lang namespace, you will find Java Lang app dynamics something something. The reason for that, if you ever wondered, or if you see like a heap dump and you see like the Java Lang something you don't understand, it is a Java agent using the instrumentation API, injecting instances into the core of the Java uh, virtual machine to reach universal visibility. Uh, yes, so that's, that's the background of this. Um, lab, yeah. yeah, I mentioned um, that Instana, for example, can upload, update itself dynamically. So how is this possible? The reason that Tomcat, for example, allows you to unload applications is that a class loader isn't only a separate namespace, it's also a garbage collectible entity. Normally, you l learn that if you load a class ever, this class is for, for all time, right? It can never be unloaded or garbage collected. That is only true if the class is loaded on the system class loader or the boot class loader, because these class loaders are sticky. If you ever create a class loader like Tomcat does, and if you dereference the class loader, then the JVM can garbage collect it. So in a way, if you write a Java agent, you want to make it updatable, you, instead of just executing your agent from the pre-main or agent main method directly, you will only create a new class loader that is the child um, of the system loader, for example, and then you uh, load your entry point manually and invoke the pre-main method in this agent itself. And then you keep a reference to this class loader to avoid that it's getting garbage collected. The next time you invoke this pre-main method, you will discover that it basically, it will just overwrite the previous instance making the previous instance disappear in the void, make it garbage collected, and replace it with the new agent. So making updatable agents isn't hard either. Something you can do yourself. Yep. Um, so what happens here, right? You have your agent version 1, then you make it, you load your agent version 2, and at some point the JVM will collect agent version 1, and it is disappearing. Uh, your other infrastructure, of course, stays in place. And again, this is something if you read agent code or if you work for, for a company that creates Java agents, then that's normally how they approach that. Right. Okay, uh, in the last 10 minutes, just a few Michelangelo um, things to mention. Um, since Java 9, the, the virtual machine has become much more restrictive uh, when it comes to many things. Um, because what Mukido, I mentioned this before, does, it attaches to its own process, to, to being able to rewrite your code to mock, right? So that's what we implemented, and that worked fine, and then Java 9 came out, and it didn't work anymore, because they added a restriction to, they basically, <laughs> uh, they looked into Mukido, said, we don't want this, um, forbid it. So what did we do? Um, now Mukido works still, if you <laughs> haven't noticed, fortunately. Um, because, what, because what we did before, basically, we attached an agent to the current JVM, then we had a, a class with a static field where we stored the instrumentation instance, and then the static field is readable to Mukedo, of course. So, hooray, we can read our own uh, field that we have just initialized after executing the agent. So the agent is nothing but execute the agent, store the 
this very privileged instrumentation instance in a field that we have access to, and then uh, we read it from there, and then we go on with our lives, right? Um, since Java 9, we cannot do this anymore, so instead of just attaching to ourselves, we start a new JVM, and the beauty of processes is that they're isolated. So the Java Virtual Machine has no chance of knowing that itself started this other JVM, so they're entirely disconnected. So there are now two disconnected Java processes, and now this new process just attaches back to its mother VM, and we are back in the game. So, yeah, shame on Oracle <laughs> for making it that hard. But it is what it is, so now every time you run Mokito, it will start a new JVM in the first second of its lifetime. This, unfortunately, is also the reason why Mokito has become much slower when you write single tests and execute single tests. It has like, it gain an extra 100 milliseconds in startup time. Because of this, if you run big test suits, it doesn't matter because it uh, amortizes. But short tests in Mokito, unfortunately, have become a little bit more painful, right? But of course, you don't have to implement this. ByteBuddy, again, has an utility. You just write ByteBuddy Magent install, and it knows a bunch of tricks there. So you can get the instrumentation instance also without an agent. I don't recommend it for production environments because it is borderline territory. So Oracle is very much yeah, busy with making this more harder uh, over time. But uh, so far, it always worked um, to find a way around. Um, what you also can do, you can tell ByteBody agent to attach a different agent to another process to make it easier. Uh, you can, of course, I've shown you the API, the virtual machine API in the beginning. You can write the code yourself, but what uh, ByteBody does for you, it uh, can work on Java 9 and Java 8. It's a bit different there. There's an extra jar file with the virtual machine API in Java 8 that you have to load in a different class loader. In Java 9, it just works out of the box, and Java 10 plus, of course, as well. Um, then also IBM in OpenJ9 uh, had its own namespace for some reason for, for the API. It's the exact same API, but it's on the IBM tools and not on the ComSun. I guess naming dispute something. And uh, since uh, two, three years, I re-implemented the entire attachment API that is shipped with OpenJDK and with OpenJ9 in native code. So that Oracle cannot break our stuff anymore. So the, th the reason that it, this is not the default is you have to add J and A, but then it basically emulates what the JVM does internally. Um, and it does it on POSIX, on Solaris, Windows, uh, and even, yeah, Solaris even, uh, and for Hotspot and OpenG9, and then you can just attach uh, always. And this is then uh, pretty solid, um, something you can rely on and write your tooling around, and a lot of people do. Right. Uh, another thing is that if you write primitive agents uh, and you instrument a lot of codes, um, unfortunately, so to speak, the JVM is a bit uh, fragile here. So if you do a lot of instrumentation, and I'd say the Java native interface that is underneath the agent API is the most buggy API in the Java virtual machine. So if you never have seen a sec fault uh, of a JVM in your life, then writing a Java agent is a good way of experiencing that. Because if you transform a lot of types, then there's always some memory barrier missing or some lock missing, and the JVM will just crash. Um, uh, a way around this is fortunately as easy as, as this. You can segregate the instrumentation of many types into batches of a certain size, and then ByteBody will basically break them up for you and instrument them in, in batches, and then normally most JVMs tolerate that. Uh, you can even do reiterating if classes are loaded during instrumentation, which is also a problem often. And uh, you can make sure that uh, failed transformations are reattempted at a later point in time, if that's something you need. Right? So there are more reasons to, to use a, a professional agent tooling instead of spinning everything yourself. Uh, a last slide to show you um, is that when you write tooling for the JVM, uh, you have to be careful how you write the tooling because uh, JVMs are very heuristical oriented. So, for example, when you do garbage collection, the JVM just assumes that that and that many objects live that and that long, and there's a young generation and a mature, a tenured generation. And uh, if a program runs by itself, it basically can find out for itself how long an average object lifetime is and then define what is young generation and tenure generation by that. If that's your object lifetime in your application, that's great. 
Uh, and then the JVM will say, all right, these short-lived objects are young generation and these long-lived objects will be promoted to the tenured generation. But if you add Java agents, run them basically in parallel, have your own logic, and you do this, right? then suddenly you change the, the, the behavior of the JVM in terms of determining what is young and what is uh, tenured generation and promote your user's application much more to tenured application. So typical problem with tooling like AppDynamics and, and all of them, I don't have to list them every time, is that you change the performance dynamics of the application by a lot. Uh, and this can be very unfortunate. This is why many developer toolings uh, write Java code in ways that you normally don't write Java anymore, like object pooling and so forth. By and the, the background is that you try to avoid um, yeah, inf interfering with the inlining and the garbage collection um, behavior that the application normally shows uh, to stay as invisible as, as only possible. All right, that's been it. That's been the definitive guide. So we've went through everything uh, you need to know if you want the right tooling or understand how it works. And that's basically the main approach. Uh, thank you so much. If you want to find me, uh, you find me on Twitter. And you find me around here tonight and tomorrow. And yeah, ByteBuddy is on GitHub. It has its web page. Documents for J is also open source software I maintain and, and distribute. So yeah, check it out as well. Thank you so much.